Therefore, time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you uh, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last month, uh, this government presented an election document in this legislature making promises they have no intention of ever keeping. And now we have the proof, Speaker. The government's budget bill, Bill 31, includes nothing, Speaker, absolutely nothing that would implement or even start to implement any of uh, their election promises. Nothing to start a child care program, nothing on long-term care, nothing on mental health care, nothing on drugs and dental for seniors is in the bill, Speaker. The Premier was writing checks she knew would bounce, Speaker. So I say to you, to the Premier, through you to the Premier, will you just admit that your budget is full of election promises, Question. that they have no intention whatsoever of keeping. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, that is absolutely not true. We absolutely are committed to implementing everything that we brought forward in our budget, Mr. Speaker. The budget bill begins that process, building the capacity in order to implement the, the, uh, all, of the, all of the care initiatives that we have in our budget, Mr. Speaker. Child care, more support for home care, Mr. Speaker, investment in hospitals, investment in mental health, all of that will be implemented, Mr. Speaker, beginning with the budget bill. Supplementary. Well, back to the uh, Premier. Not one, not one of those issues is in the actual budget bill that we'll be debating uh, this afternoon. But the Premier couldn't help herself, Speaker. Here's what she did include in that budget bill. All of the $2 billion of tax increases ah. made it into that budget bill, Speaker. Schedule 32 and 33 allow the government to implement their $2 billion in tax increases on 1.8 million uh, Ontarians and their families and businesses. But the Premier has gone a step farther. She's left herself a loophole to bring in further taxes oh, no. after the election is over oh. and before the end of the year. That little clause made it into the budget bill, Speaker. Oh, no. That's right. Ontario, uh, the Premier is planning to hit you with even more taxes after the election to feed this spending addiction. Question. Speaker, to the Premier, will she be honest with Ontario families and admit that there is a loophole to hit them with more taxes after the election? Please. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, I completely understand why the Leader of the Opposition would not want to talk about anything that they are thinking about doing, Mr. Speaker. A, because there is nothing that they are thinking about doing, Mr. Speaker. And B, the only thing we know is that that party, under Doug Ford, wants to take $10 billion out of services across this province. Mr. Speaker, we are we are committed to building on the foundation that has already been constructed in this province. So, Mr. Speaker, we have full day kindergarten up and operating. Thousands of children this morning went to full day kindergarten because of what our government did. And, Mr. Speaker, in that same vein, we have promised and will deliver free preschool childcare, Mr. Speaker. Children across this province already have free prescription medication with OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker. In that vein, we will expand OHIP Plus and include seniors, Mr. Speaker. We've Thank built you. the foundation. We're going to continue to Here. build. Thank you. Stop, stop, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker, again. None of those promises are in the budget bill, wow. but there are more tax increases that are in the budget bill. The bill allows the government to hike taxes on small businesses. These tax increases mirror Prime Minister Trudeau's tax increases introduced last fall. Some 20,000 businesses in Ontario will now each be paying $2,400 a year more in taxes. So, to recap, Speaker, there's nothing in the bill to implement any of the Premier's big-ticket, big-spending election promises, but she's included everything to implement the tax increases we first told you about, the ones the Premier will never mention. The government simply can't be trusted. Speaker to the Premier, why does she and her government Question. believe votes are for sale in Ontario? Uh, thank you. 
Minister of Finance. Speaker, the member opposite is talking about a budget bill that's before this debate right now, and he's recognizing that we need to en enable some of those activities in order to persuade and facilitate the actual budget. Now, the year in spending that is being produced is uh, outlined, and everything that we're doing going forward is very well outlined. The member opposite, however, has not indicated one iota of what it is that they're going to do, what it is that they're going to cut, what it is that they're going to hurt the people of Ontario and our economy. We've outlined it very clearly. We've displayed very appropriately what we are about to do, and we put it forward to the future, Mr. Speaker, because we must feel and must think uh, forward, Mr. Speaker. You can't look backwards, and you can't just look at the moment. you got to look at what's going to happen in the future. These are not election cycle decisions. These are long-term decisions that have Tremendous impact on families across Answer. the province of Ontario. They should know that. Yes, we are in warnings. I've made it clear to you that I will listen carefully to the first round of questions, and your indication is you need someone to warn you. It's on. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question again is for the Premier. The government's Bill 31 is full of even more surprises. On page 307, the absolute last page of the budget, the last line, the government built in another massive loophole for themselves regarding what qualifies for cap and trade money. And sure enough, it's in the bill as well. That made it to the bill, Speaker, Schedule 3. It will allow the government to provide cap-and-trade funds now for anything it deems, quote, likely to reduce greenhouse gases. So, Speaker, that could you, they could use that money to literally pay for just about anything they uh, plan on. So not only that, but the government, through the bill, will reassign $366 million of 2015 previous expenses Question. to the cap-and-trade account. Speaker, to the Premier, isn't this exactly why Ontario families don't trust this government? We need them to, sca to, to scrap the cap-and-trade slush fund. Mr. Speaker, um, let's, just, let's just be clear. So the reality is that not not every. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from uh, Lanark Front Athletics in Addington is warned. And I have about three more that I'm waiting for the next move. Premier. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We've laid out a very clear plan for how we're going to move forward, Mr. Speaker. Not every part of that plan requires legislative change. So the budget, the budget lays out the areas where there is a need for legislative change. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that all of the revenue from the cap and trade uh, system, Mr. Speaker, which is forcing big polluters to pay, Mr. Speaker, and pay for that pollution, Mr. Speaker, all of that money is being reinvested in homes to help people retrofit fit their homes in uh, businesses Answer. to help them to innovate, Mr. Speaker. And we believe that reducing pollution and reducing greenhouse gas emissions is an important part of our job. They do not believe that, Mr. Speaker, but we do. Thank you. To the Premier, this government has yet another surprise for Ontario businesses. Oh, no. In Schedule 30 of the bill, this will require small businesses to install an electronic cash register, but doesn't specify which business would be impacted. So, Speaker, the legislation would allow ministry inspectors the ability to in enter their home to make sure home-run businesses are utilizing these registers and allow for stiff penalties if they aren't, up to $10,000. Speaker, to the Premier, why doesn't she trust small business owners, and why is the Premier continuing to wage a war on small business? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, well, we're actually consulting with small businesses on exactly that. But I would ask the uh, I would ask the member opposite: Does he support putting uh, more than a billion dollars uh, into mental health, Mr. Speaker? Does he support having uh, no. interdisciplinary approach so that that young people can get the mental health supports that they need? Does he support putting 822 million dollars into hospitals so people can get health care faster? Does he support the notion that if young moms want to go back to work and they can't find childcare, we should put a system in place so that they can do that, Mr. Speaker? Does he support seniors having free pharmacare, Mr. No. Speaker? Because if he does, he might want to speak to his leader. Because $10 billion taken out of all of the services that are delivered in this province not only will not allow him to support those things, but there will be teachers, there will be nurses, Answer. there will be public servants Answer. across this province who deliver those services who will no longer have jobs, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Sadly, none of the promises the, sp the Premier is speaking about are in the bill, Speaker. It's clear the government's budget and legislation is all about serving the Liberals' self interest, not the interests of families or businesses. Big talk, election promises, but nothing to implement them. All aspirational, nothing operational. The Premier wrote many checks in the budget, Speaker, but the the bill is proof she knows those checks would have bounced. Loopholes to allow the government to increase taxes by $2 billion on Ontario families and businesses. And loopholes to allow them to continue to pad the pockets of insiders with their cap and trade slush fund. It's clear this is all about trying to fool the people of Ontario just before an election. Speaker, to the Premier, the party with the taxpayers' money is over, and our message Question. to the people of Ontario help is on the way. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Premier. You know, Mr. Speaker, the woman who um, came up to me when I was uh, standing on the, the bridge in Pickering at the GO station, who came up to me and said, please, please make sure that you get that child care in place. She's actually not interested in a slogan. She's actually not interested in uh, a faulty analysis of a piece of legislation that, you know, the budget bill, Mr. Speaker, it lays out the aspects of the budget plan that need legislative change. There's a difference between policy and legislation, Mr. Speaker, and I, I, you know, I'm sure that the member opposite knows that, but he's been handed a piece of paper with a series of slogans on it, slogans that are not going to help one child get childcare, not going to help one senior get more home care, not going to help one teenager get mental health, Mr. Speaker, yeah, mental health support. Those slogans, those slogans are not going to cut it, Mr. Speaker. Yep, yep. We need to make sure that we put the supports in place that people are looking for. And what he is talking about, Mr. Speaker, is cutting across government that will not serve the people of this no. province. You see it, please. You see it, please. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Everyone in Ontario deserves to be able to, to see a dentist to stay healthy and fill prescriptions when they need them. The Premier has a plan that leaves people without prescription drug coverage that they need and leaves them without the dental care that they need. I have a plan to provide dental and drug coverage to every Ontarian. Why doesn't the Premier? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, again, I will say to the leader of the third party, I do not disagree with her that we need to have more support for dental care in this province and in this country, Mr. Speaker. I believe that it's very important, and the reality is that we have uh, we have put in place supports, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's more that has to be done. Um, we've expanded. Uh, we're expanding OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker. Right now, uh, kids are getting pharmacare free up until their 25th birthday. We're expanding that to seniors, Mr. Speaker, and we're putting a new dental program in place that will be $700 a year for a family of four for that can 
be applied to dental costs. I know, Mr. Speaker, that we need to have more nationally. We will continue to work with ministers of health and with the uh, premiers across, across the province to work with the, the prime minister and the uh, federal government to see if we can move towards that, Mr. Speaker. But in the interim, Ontario Thank is you. moving forward. Supplementary. Speaker, Debbie is from London, and she's self-employed. She hasn't gone to the dentist in 10 years. She told me, and I quote, when something finally went really wrong a year and a half ago and I had to go, it cost nearly $2,000. Wow. Under the Premier's plan, Debbie would be left shouldering $1,700 in costs. The Premier called her campaign budget, quote, a plan for care and opportunity. She had the opportunity to show she cared for people like Debbie. Why didn't she take it? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I do care for people like Debbie. Yes. I do care for people who are looking for support. I think it is a very, very serious problem, Mr. Speaker. And there are a number of challenges that people are facing right now. Dental care is one of them, which is why we have put the, uh, the dental plan in place. And as I said, I know that there is more that needs to be done on that front, Mr. Speaker. But there are other people who are looking for support, too. There are families who are looking for support for their <laughs> beloved elderly parent or grandparent, Mr. Speaker. We need to make sure that we put more home care and more support in place for, uh, for those people. There are families who are looking for support for one of their uh, members that has a mental health challenge. We need to make sure that we put that support in place too, Mr. Speaker. There are young families who are looking for child care who can't find it. We need to make sure that support is in place too. I understand Sir? that the leader of the third party is very focused on this issue, as am I. It is a very serious issue. But, Mr. Speaker, there is a whole, there is a whole package of issues that people are looking yes. at. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, after 15 years in government, this Premier thinks that she can tell the people of this province she's suddenly the care bearer of Ontario. Uh, Give me a break. 15 years, Speaker. Where was she for 15 years? Amanda. Amanda lives in London, Speaker, and she works with Star. Start the clock, please. Later. Amanda said this, and I quote, if people had guaranteed dental coverage for them and for their kids, and they knew it would come with them on that entrepreneurial journey, that would remove a lot of the stress of starting a business. It would be a game changer, end of quote. Instead, the Premier's budget allows for a $300 rebate to cover a parent's, a parent's drug and dental together, and $50, 50 bucks for children. Guaranteed dental coverage would actually be a game changer. Changer, speaker, helping people to start their new businesses, for example. After 15 years, the Premier had a chance Question. to show that she cared. Why didn't she take that opportunity? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I um I appreciate the uh, the question from the leader of the third party, but I just I would just ask her to look at um, look at the the things that have um, have been done in this province over the last number of years, Mr. Speaker. You know we have we have been working for a number of years on this particular issue, Mr. Speaker, expanding the Healthy Smiles program. This is not a new issue for us. It may be a new issue for the leader of the third party, but it's not a new issue for us, Mr. Speaker. We've been working on this for years, and so it's great that the leader of the third party is now advocating for uh, for de a dental program, Mr. Speaker. But we've been working to put in place a support we've been working with dentists mr speaker to expand that program so likewise mr speaker the issues that that were confronting us you know I'm only in politics, Mr. Speaker. I'm only in provincial politics because of the mess that was left after the last Conservative government. I got involved in Answer. politics because our education system, our health care system, the relationship between the province and the municipalities was in tatters. That's why I'm involved. I cared Thank enough you. then, and I care enough now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, leader of the third party. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier, and I can tell you this: I have paid attention to the fact that the Liberals sold off Hydro One during their terms yeah. in office, that they brought hallway medicine to the province of Ontario, yeah. that they had a gas plant scandal where today someone got sentenced to four months in jail oh, yeah. for deleting emails on behalf of Liberals. Speaker, that's what I've been paying attention to. But you know what? The Premier has an issue here in this province in terms of her track record, and I want to ask her straight up: Does she acknowledge that? That she has brought hallway medicine to the province of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what I will acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, is that every single year since I've been the Premier and before, we have increased the budget for health, Mr. Speaker, health care in this province. We have increased hospital budgets. We have increased home care budgets, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that the health care system in Ontario is undergoing and has undergone a, a significant transformation. The demographics in this province are changing, and we just heard in the, uh, in the uh, tribute to uh, Mr. Van Horn the issues around the changing demographic, demographic that he foresaw and that we are now dealing with, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that there are more people receiving care in their homes because that's where they want to be, Mr. Speaker. And so over the last number of years, we have increased the funding to that home care. We recognize, Mr. Speaker, that there needs Answer. to be increased funding on that, increased funding for long-term care, and increased funding for hospitals. But, Mr. Well, Speaker, well. every year we have put more money in the budget for health care in this province. Supplementary. Premier, or, sorry, Speaker, the Premier has not ever actually addressed here in this legislature that Ontario's hospitals are significantly overcrowded or that we are actually in a hallway medicine crisis. Does this Premier deny that there's a hallway medicine crisis here in Ontario? Because I think the fact that we put $500 million more new dollars into uh, the budget for hospitals last year, $822 million this year, Mr. Speaker, I think that is a clear acknowledgement that there is a serious challenge that hospitals are facing that we need to deal with in order to help people get faster health care when they get into hospital. But, Mr. Speaker, it is not a simplistic issue. The reality is that there are people who are in acute beds right now who need to be in other places. And so, along with putting that money into hospitals, we're creating those other places, Mr. Speaker. We're creating transitions. We're creating a continuum of care that will allow people to get the care that they need where they need it, Mr. Speaker. So, I know that the leader of the third party doesn't want to acknowledge that there's a complexity to this at all, but there yes, is. Sir. People need different care at different times in their lives, and we are working to make sure that they get the right Thank care you. where and when they need it. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. Fifteen years, Speaker. They would have figured out the complexity and started fixing the system instead of making it worse, which is what they've done, Speaker. Cutting hospital budgets has left us in a crisis in hospital care that leaves people in hallways every single day in our province. It is unacceptable, and it is because of the behaviour of this Premier and her determination to cut those hospitals back as much as she possibly could. And it is very cynical that right before an election, she's suddenly talking about more funding for hospital speaker. That's what makes people very cynical about the motives of this Premier and her government. Look, sometimes you actually do have to make a, an admission that there's a problem before you can start to solve it. There is an overcrowding crisis in Ontario's hospitals. As Premier, I will solve it. Will the Premier tell Question. Ontarians why she didn't care that she allowed things to get this bad? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, why would just I just think we have to ask why would the Premier of the Province of Ontario want to create a health care crisis in hospitals? Why? Why would I? Why would I want to do that? Now, Mr. Speaker, I know, I know that to paraphrase, I would like to remind some members they're already warned. In case you forgot, because the next move is a naming, and others who normally don't are getting in that kind of area. 
was a former education minister in this province who said that creating, creating a crisis was the way to go. But as I said earlier, I got involved in politics because that's exactly not what I believe, Mr. Speaker. So why would I, who got involved in politics, because I believe, because I believe that government exists to do. The member from Essex is warned, and the leader of the third party is warned. The minister, <clears throat> the, mini the Treasury Board president is warned. And as soon as you get a warning, if you say something else, you can get named. Premier. Government exists to do the things that people can't do by themselves, and health care is the finest example of our expression of our value that we care for one another, Mr. Speaker, in this province. So, Mr. Speaker, I have worked with my colleagues, with the, the health care sector, to do everything in my power to make sure that people get the care that they need. That is the responsibility of the Premier of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and I take my responsibility very, very seriously. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Rampton Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is to the Premier. On March 1st, thanks to this Liberal government, the basic tax on a case of beer went up for consumers, and there is a further 26% tax hike planned for November. Meanwhile, Speaker, the federal Liberals have brought in an excise tax on beer that will go up every single year. And after those new taxes are applied, beer drinkers will pay HST on top of it all, paying more tax on tax. Speaker, at the end of the day, 47 per cent of what the people in this province pay for their beer goes directly to the government—47 per cent. Mr. Speaker, why should consumers pay for this government's wasteful spending? No wonder everybody goes Thank you. Thank you. Finance. Finance. Speaker, the 2018 budget it did not include any changes to beer taxes. There's an annual indexation of the tax rate based on CPI. It's baked into the legislation. It takes effect March 1st every year, but this would have already have happened in the prior budgets. As announced in the 2015 budget, the price of beer will increase by three cents per litre on November 1st of 2015, 16, 17, and 18. This amounts to about one cent per bottle, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. This increase has taken place every November since 2015, and the final increase will take place on November 1, 2018. The price of beer is expected to remain below the Canadian average. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, back to the, to the Premier. While this government is making the people of this province pay more for their beer, they're also using their hard-earned tax dollars for corporate subsidies to beer companies. In fact, just last week, this government announced a $1.3 million grant to a Toronto brewery. The Liberals are running up the bill for beer and leaving it all on the taxpayers' tab. First, they rate our wallets for consumption taxes, and then they come back for more to fund corporate welfare. Speaker, it's enough to drive people to drink. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain the logic behind handing out subsidies to an industry with one policy while driving up their costs with another? Oh, no. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we just introduced expansion of beer and wine in grocery stores. We are now providing 20 per cent shelf space for uh, craft beer and microbrew. Yeah. We announced just uh, earlier this week revisions to reduce their overall tax rate to enable them to have more success, to invest in their product and grow their companies, Mr. Speaker. I don't see that as corporate welfare. I see that as being a partner to enable those very companies, those small businesses that they seem to care about, to grow and invest and provide them more opportunity. That's what we've done, and that's what we're enabling them to provide for more jobs. And I'm pleased to say that our craft brew and our small businesses in the province of Ontario are outperforming every other brewery in North America because of the provisions and, and the sir? enablement that we put in place. We're helping small businesses, we're helping our microbrews and craft beer, and we did not increase taxes, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since 2016, my staff in Windsor have been working with a woman named Julie who battled severe oral cancer. Julie has already undergone a number of medical procedures since she lost a significant part of her lower jaw. But for years, Julie has also required surgery for permanent dentures. 
Without this dental procedure, she is only able to consume liquids, and her ability to speak is impaired. This is a significant health issue, which seriously impacts Julie's quality of life. But this procedure is not covered by OHIP or any government program, and the Ministry of Health has failed to offer any concrete solutions for Julie. What does the Premier have to say to Julie? Will she acknowledge that her Liberal government has failed Julie? Health and long-term care. Minister of Health, long-term care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, the case as described by the member opposite sounds like something that uh, needs further investigation. I am certainly now the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I certainly welcome hearing more about this case. I'm all about concrete solutions. I think uh, uh, my track record shows that. In this particular case, I would just simply say to the member, I would urge you to approach me with the uh, uh, the details of this particular case. I assure the member that I will look further into uh, the specific uh, information, assuming that we have the patient's consent to do so. Uh, but in a more general sense, of course, on this side of the House, we care deeply about oral health care. We know it's an essential part of our health care, and uh, I welcome uh, hearing Answer. more about this specific case. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Actually, my staff has been working directly with the Ministry of Health since May of 2016, and I handed the file myself to the Minister of Health in May of 2017. So if you're not familiar with the file, perhaps you should look it up and follow up with it. The promised Liberal dental refund would only provide up to $400 in coverage for a single person's dental and drug costs, and it will only come after people have paid out of pocket, paid up front. Julie, Julie is already struggling to keep up with the costs of her medication, so there's no way that Julie would be able to get the denture she needs with the Premier's inadequate refund. This Liberal government has had 15 years to create a comprehensive dental care plan, and they chose not to. They have left people like Julie behind. Why does this Liberal government Question. think it's acceptable to force Julie and others like her to choose between their medication and the dental care they need? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the reality is we're taking the burden of health care costs, including dental care, away from families, and we're doing this in a historic way at a historic pace. It's exactly what we've done with our new dental program. $700 per year for a family of dental costs now covered. And I know the NDP are trying to obscure our uh, historic investment by saying that uh, we're just uh, giving $50 per child, but that just simply isn't true. This is a lump sum for a family of four of $700, and it's going to make a real difference in people's lives. It's going to cover some four exams for low or middle income family without coverage, with enough left over to pay for fillings or additional cleaning if needed. It's going to ensure those children know the value of growing Answer. up with good oral care and that years down the road they will have the confidence of good oral health. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. And a question the member from Republican North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services and Head of the Anti-Racism Directorate, the Honourable Michael Coteau. Speaker, racism and discrimination against any community in Ontario is unwelcome. And that should apply to any candidates who aspire to serve in this legislature. And solutions deserve more than bumper sticker pitches and jet skis. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for attending a function in Etobicoke, an anti-gun violence forum put on by the Somali community of uh, Etobicoke. And uh, Speaker, one year ago, our government introduced the Ontario Black Youth Action Plan, investment of $47 million for the next several years. And of course, this focused on the well-being and success of black children and youth, collaborating with black community organizations who are already doing commendable work across communities across Ontario. Speaker, my question is this. Can you provide, Minister, to this House an update on the Ontario Black Youth question. Action Plan? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services, Minister of Community and Social Services, and Minister responsible for anti-racism. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for his advocacy on this issue. Uh, I've been in the legislature for six and a half years, and I've constantly worked with him on issues. And I want to thank him for being part of the Somali uh, Canadian uh, Youth Forum this weekend. Thank you very much for your advocacy and your work. 
I'm so proud, Mr. Speaker, of the work uh, that's being done by the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, specifically ar around the implementation of the Black Youth Action Plan. Uh, these are dedicated public servants that took a concept of, over a year ago and implemented this brand new plan. And in just one year, Mr. Speaker, we have over 70 organizations that are receiving money uh, from this government to specifically to work with uh, Black youth across the province of Ontario. And 50 of those organizations have never had relationships with uh, the provincial government before. And these programs are focused on mentorship, prevention, higher education, career development, community Answer. outreach and collaboration. Very and in the supplemental, I'll talk about some of the specifics of those programs. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, not only for your answer, your commitment to the serious issue of anti-racism, but also for moving beyond slogans and decorative labels from elevator pitchmen who decide selectively to show up in front of the press. Speaker, this is a sign of care and not cuts. There are 50 programs underway right now, and I appreciate the integrated approach with school boards from K-12, Children's Aid, the Youth Justice and Correctional Services. Speaker, these programs are having a direct and felt and lived experience impact on the ground in Etobicoke, in the GTHA, in Ottawa and Windsor. In particular, for example, in Etobicoke, the information technology programs are particularly well received by the youth. Speaker, these investments take a targeted community-based approach to increase access to culturally focused supports and opportunities for children, youth and families to address a number of different disparities. Minister, can you share with this House how these programs will support black children and youth to provide Question. opportunity to grow, learn and succeed in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So far, we've launched Together We Can Youth Mentorship Initiative. This funds 25 programs right across this province, wow. and they're developed by local organizations to meet local needs. Grassroots. We've also funded five new industry uh, job uh, training internship and placement initiatives. The goal is to help youth kickstart their careers while increasing black representation in some of our province's best paid and fastest growing sectors, like software development, com computer animation, and digital media. And of course, we know that parents, caregivers, and families play a vital role in supporting children and youth. That's why we are funding 10 innovative projects that support black parents, including an app that helps new mothers track their routines impressive. and connects them with pre- Very and impressive. postnatal support. And another project will help young fathers, uh, and it will uh, find places and coordinate places for them Crucial. to meet um, that they're comfortable in to provide right. mentorship and it's provide them with the skills necessary to better raise their children. Your question, the member from Stoma, Donda, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. First, I'd like to thank the Minister on her years of service to her constituents and wish her well after June 7. Speaker, the Ministry of Government, the Ministry of Government and Consumer Service oversees the Technical Standards and Safety Association. We learned this morning on CBC that this agency actually has a policy of not keeping records of certain safety inspections. This is unacceptable, and the fact that such a policy exists is indicative of just how the TSSA thinks itself above the norms of accountability and integrity. What is it that this government is trying to help the TSSA hide? Government, well, first, I want to thank the member for his kind words. Very appreciated. Thank you very much. So, um, and thank you for the question too. Uh, I saw the story as well. And as the member knows, the TSSA is responsible for administering and enforcing uh, standards in different sectors, whether it's fuels, boiler and pressure vessels, and operating engineers, elevating devices, amusement devices, upholstery and stuff, articles, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, they are often the first responders, and uh, in case of uh, when the fire marshals conned it called in or investigations of uh, public safety, which is at the core of their mandate. And in terms of uh, residential record keeping, which I believe the minister or the member is referring to rather, um, the TSSA has advised my ministry they've enhanced their documentation process and since January of this year, all residential yes, inspections sir. now include a record of inspe inspection. I'll be glad to answer more on a supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. When Justice Cunningham laid bare the unacceptable situation at Terryog, which had been known to consumers and stakeholders for years, the minister appeared genuinely contrite 
and say that the agency had drifted too far from government. Speaker, the TSSA is no different. For 15 years, the government refused to provide a clear direction towards integrity, accountability, and transparency. What was supposed to remain at arm's length within the grasp of government if the need arose appears to now move to another planet. Information that should be disclosed to residents is claimed not to exist. But when the ministry came calling, poof, out of thin air, the information suddenly appears in their mailboxes. Will this ministry finally bring some shred of accountability and integrity to the TSSA and stand up for the residents of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. So, uh, again, thank you for the question. And the member knows full well, as my critic, that the TSSA is a delegated administrative authority, and as such, uh, technical questions should be directed to them. In this case, my understanding is also that the TSSA has gone above and beyond in, in responding to uh, nearby uh, consumer uh, concerns, so I, I thank them for doing that. But, Speaker, I have to ask, with all due respect, um, the PC government and its planned cuts, I have to ask what that will do in terms of consumer services. Will there be less inspections? Will there be less enforcement? Will they uh, curtail the powers of our important delegated admin authorities that focus on safety and security on. of people in Ontario? Will, will it affect Answer. other offerings by the government in terms of uh, what Service Ontario does and the wait times? Will that, those increase? Thank you. Will there be cuts to services and programs? That's New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. In 2009, Ontario was facing the H1N1 crisis, and the, the government decided to only release an English pamphlet. The government apologized and said it would change things, but today the French language services commission saying that Metrolinx is still only doing English advertisements. The LCBO is doing the same thing and it's actually directing francophones towards a website that's the same for OLG, which says that it does not have to follow or doesn't want to follow the rules with respect to French language services. Is the Premier satisfied with her work with respect to French language services? Because we certainly are not. Thank you very much for this question. We know that we have a lot of work to do. We're working with the Commissioner in order to improve this situation. But I would like to assure the member that we have a good relationship with the Francophone community, and we know that we need to make sure that services in French are accessible throughout the province. Thank you. After 15 years of this Liberal government, the situation has become very problematic. On one hand, there's a lack of respect towards French language services by the government, towards the French Language Services Act, and towards its own rules with respect to advertisements. So francophones don't have access to information, and there are consequences, and this puts French language media at risk. Who play in a very important role in the preservation of our linguistic and cultural identity. Why is the Liberal government not taking its responsibility seriously with respect to francophones, and why is he continuing to forget us? Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you very much for the question. I'd like to thank the Commissioner, who today tabled certain recommendations in his uh, report. We take these recommendations very seriously. Each ministry has communication directives, which are very specific. All press releases are bilingual. Is there still work to do? I think that we need to think about our governmental agencies, which are responsible for their own advertisement. It's something that we've talked about. In fact, during the conference, federally of our ministry. We need to do more work on this file, and I agree with the Premier. Our commitment towards the Francophone community is very strong and very serious. If we look at what we've done over the last few years, and again, I'd like to thank the Commissioner. 
The member from Scarborough Legion Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. I was very pleased to see the uh, 2018 budget to include and expand investment and support of Ontarians with developmental disability and their family. And Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to many constituents in my riding of Scarborough Legion Court with developmental disability and their family, and I heard about the support to ensure the development disability are truly thriving and include their community. And just this past week, Mr. Speaker, the member from Trinity Spadana and I attended a very special event hosted by the world's largest vegetarian restaurant chain, Saravana Bahana Restaurant. Wow. The CEO, Ganeshan Sukumar, supporting our developmental disability students with autism, Mr. Speaker, and supporting the South Asian Autism Center Question. in Scarborough. Speaker, through you to the uh, minister, can he please share with the House what his ministry is doing continue to support individuals and the family with developmental disability? Thank you. Good. Minister of Children and Youth Services, Community Social Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court for the question and for her advocacy on uh, behalf of individuals with developmental disabilities. I also just want to take a moment to thank uh, the former minister, who's now the Minister of Health, for a lot of the work that I'm about to, uh, to mention here today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yeah, thank you. Over the past decade, our government has been transforming the developmental service sector. Since 2003, we've increased the annual budget in this sector by over $1.3 billion wow. to ensure that more individuals have access to services that they need. Although we've made some important progress, Mr. Speaker, we know that there's a lot more work to be done. And that's why in this year's budget, we're investing an additional $1.8 billion over the next three years in support of adults with developmental disabilities. This is the largest, Mr. Speaker, the largest one-time investment to developmental services in Canadian Answer. history. This means Ontario history. This means for the first time in our province, every eligible adult with developmental disability would get at least $5,000 a year for direct funding through the passports. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for his answer. I'm pleased to be part of the government that continues to commit to making improvements to the developmental service sector. The expansion of the passport program will make a significant difference in the lives of adults with developmental disabilities, especially the youth who are turning 18 and transitioning into adult services. And I know, Mr. Speaker, the students in my riding of Scarborough Agent Corps, Sir William Olsa High School, their students will greatly appreciate the expansion of the passport program. The investment will ensure that gains made to the children and youth program, and this government has also made significant investment that will not be lost when the young person turns 18. Speaker, I understand that $1.8 billion investment will do more than just expanding the passport program. Through you, Speaker, to the minister, can he please mm -hmm. to expand about the Question. investment on this particular uh, billions of dollars in developmental services, and how is this going to help the young people? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to the member. In addition, Mr. Speaker, um, this new plan will support over 800 people who are homeless or require different residential supports to move into more appropriate residence while they will receive the right supports in their, for, for their particular needs. Uh, support uh, aging caregivers by providing increased support and making significant capital investments, creating new residential space. We've also heard the concerns from de developmental agencies, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're increasing approximately $300 million over the next three years to these agencies right across the province. While our government remains committed to supporting and investing in Ontario, with develop, uh, in specifically around developmental disabilities, I'd like to remind this House that the parties opposite remain completely silent on how they intend to support individuals with developmental disabilities here in Ontario. Answer. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. Struggling Ontario taxpayers have waited seven long years for answers on how $1.1 billion of their hard-earned money could be wasted to save a few seats in an election. Today, the Ontario justice system has run its course, but no sentence is going to return the billion dollars that was thrown away. The gas plant scandal court case has come to a close, and the Liberal Chief of Staff has been sentenced to four months in jail. Speaker, to the wow. Premier, will she condemn, here and now, the actions of the Liberal government? Here, here. 
Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I, I'm sure, Speaker, as, uh, as the member is well aware, this matter uh, is, uh, is before the courts by, by way of an appeal, so it would be highly inappropriate uh, uh, for the government uh, or anybody to speak to this matter. But I want to make it very clear, Speaker, that, uh, that this Premier uh, and this government are uh, absolutely committed to accountability and transparency when it comes to all government records. In fact, uh, Speaker, uh, the, the Premier uh, coming into office immediately moved on making sure that we make the important and necessary changes uh, to our laws uh, to protect and, and enforce accountability and transparency. As a result, Speaker, we, we have put a, uh, brought in place mandatory record-keeping rules and staff training. We also brought in the Accountability Act that Answer. prohibits the willful deletion of records and creates a penalty. There are new rules limiting political staff involvement in commercial third-party transactions and have, uh, and have brought other such rules Thank to you. ensure that we have strong transparency in account. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Over the last 15 years, there's been a pattern of concerning behaviour in the Liberal government. This government did everything in their power to thwart our investigation, Speaker, including shutting down this Premier shutting down our investigation after the 2014 sure, yeah, right. election. There was a systemic pattern of deception operated from the higher, highest levels of Liberal government. The judge said the Liberal chief interfered with the democratic process. He called it egregious and that the Liberal chief's conduct was an affront to democratic values. Speaker, why have the Liberals consistently put their political self-interest and insider Question. friends ahead of the hard-working people of Ontario? Given the situation, I am uh, not going to ask for a withdrawal, but I will remind the member that he did use language that was very close to being uh, unparliamentary, and I would advise him not to go there. Attorney General. Speaker, let me be, let me be very clear. Uh, we take our obligations very seriously. Uh, the Premier and the government is absolutely committed to being open, accountable and transparent. Speaker, the Premier and the government promised to open up the government completely, and we have done so at, at, at an un, to an unprecedented degree. In her report, the Information and Privacy Commissioner then credited our government for improving record-keeping across the government. We sent a directive to all political staff. We have developed mandatory training programs and have delivered uh, to ensure that all staff have been trained. We have appointed chiefs of staff accountable for record keeping. We have improved archiving requirements. In addition, Speaker, we brought in an accountability act that would prohibit the willful deletion of records and will create a penalty. And Speaker, uh, in addition, uh, we have continued to work with the Integrity Commissioner and the Information and Privacy Commissioner to make sure that these robust rules are fully implemented on an ongoing basis. This is our commitment and obligation Answer. to the people of Ontario, and we take that commitment and obligation very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Your question? The member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 33 schools in the area of Sudbury, including schools in my area of Algoma, Manitoulin, have tested above the acceptable provincial drinking waters as far as standards for lead. The tests show that they have doubled over the past two years. When will this government take action and invest in our northern schools so our youth can get clean drinking water? Minister, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you for the uh, question. It's a very, uh, very important one. You know, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change takes uh, safeguarding our drinking water very seriously. We've said this a number of times, and I stand by that, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've been working with the federal government on uh, on proposed new standards of, of in fact, of five parts per billion rather than the current ten parts per billion for lead in uh, in water. And we have very strict compliance regulations in place to ensure that Ontarians have safe water to drink. And because of this, Mr. Speaker, we have among 
along the strongest uh, framework for safe drinking water in all of North America. So we already require public and private schools and daycares to annually test for lead, uh, something few provinces, uh, provinces actually uh, can claim. Uh, but this past Answer. summer, we went even further, Speaker. We're now ensuring every water tap providing drinking water to children in schools and child care centres is sampled. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier, a trend like this one can be harmful to the health of our children. I know the member of Nickel Belt has been contacted by numerous parents from Onipping, Valcare, and Lavac, Dowling, and I've been receiving many calls at my constituency office from parents across Algoma, Manitoulin, who are basically asking questions, questions and concerns for their children. The Ministry of Education should act immediately to ensure schools are safe and healthy for students. Premier, let's get back to the classroom basics of education. Is this government ready to offer immediate help to those 33 schools and focus on their real priorities and their needs of an education system and the schools that our kids deserve? Thank you, Minister. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this very important question. And absolutely, every child in a uh, child care centre or in schools across Ontario have to be drinking clean, safe water. And I want you to know that I am confident that our standards are the strongest in Canada. We have strict rules in place requiring immediate action should an issue arise, and parents can rest assured and know that their kids are drinking safe water. In fact, Speaker, we have a long-term plan to address instances. I know that the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change is working with the federal government on certain things, but we now require even more testing at an even higher standard to make sure that every single school and childcare centre in the province uh, is tested for lead, and we are the only province to do so. Answer. In the rare situation where a problem is identified, corrective actions are taken immediately by the school under the supervision of the local Medical Officer of Health, and we ask Thank that you. boards communicate with us. Thank you. New question. The member from Guelph. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Transportation. You know, Speaker, Guelph is a phenomenal place to live, raise a family, yes, work, or pursue post-secondary education. And it's a community that I have been very proud to represent for so many years. As the members of this House know, our government recently tabled Budget 2018, which builds on our previous investments in care and opportunity. Speaker, a critical part of creating opportunity is making sure that there are convenient, reliable transit and transportation options so that you can get to that new job or home to your family faster than you can do right now. So as the MPP for Guelph, a top priority is making sure that options, including high-speed rail, Question. are available across southwestern Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please provide the members of this House with more information on how Budget 2018 invests in getting southwestern Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Guelph for the question and also for all of her work on behalf of her community. Speaker, we know that high-speed rail will boost the economy in southwestern Ontario, connect more people to quality jobs, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's why, since receiving the positive business case for high-speed rail from our special advisor, we have continued to move forward. Specifically, we have continued the necessary planning work and recently awarded a contract for the EA Terms of Reference for the corridor from London to, to Kitchener. But we also know that we can't afford to wait. We need to keep making progress, and that's why I'm pleased to confirm that Budget 2018 includes an initial $11 billion investment to build and deliver high-speed rail. This funding will go towards Phase 1 of the project. Will prepare us to Answer. build phase two, which will extend the line to Windsor, including a stop in Chatham. It's a very exciting time for transit in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. That is a fantastic investment. $11 billion. Great news. Great news. 
And with a planned stop in Guelph, I know that the people in my community are really excited to hear the announcement that the Premier and the Minister made on Friday. We know that our government is behind high-speed rail because we are making the necessary investments to build this transformative project. These are exactly the type of investments that make it more attractive for people to live in my community in Guelph and go to work in Toronto or Kitchener, or you could live in Toronto and come and work in Guelph. It'll work both ways. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please provide more information on why our government is committed to moving forward on high-speed rail and how it fits in with our larger plan for transit and transportation in southwestern Ontario? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Guelph uh, for her question, but also for her support at last Friday's announcement. It was very exciting. Yeah, yeah. High-speed rail, Speaker, goes hand-in-hand -hand with other critical transit and transportation projects that we're delivering right across southwestern Ontario. This includes delivering two-way, all-day go service to Kitchener-Waterloo, which Kitchener. we announced a major step forward on this past Friday with our EA, as well as supporting local rapid transit projects like the Waterloo Ion in my home region. As the Premier said, the best time to build high-speed rail was 30 years ago. The second best time is right now, and that's exactly why we're moving aggressively forward. But while some believe we can cut our way to economic success, Change members on this Change side of the House know that sir. that's not the bill, way to build this province up. Now's the time to invest in the services, including trans transit options, that the people of this province need and deserve. Thank you. New question, the member from Haldeman, Norfolk. Minister of Municipal Affairs, Norfolk County is the farm bunkhouse capital of Canada. There's 5,000 farm workers in Norfolk and housed in uh, 500 uh, bunkhouses. Apparently, the building code contains provisions that are meant to prevent problems in urban areas, but they're causing big headaches in rural Ontario. As farmers assemble land, they often inherit uh, large old farmhouses that were used to uh, accommodate families of up to 10 or more. Farmers use these dwellings to house workers. However, as a deputation of Norfolk County Council tells us, the building code does not allow more than four unrelated individuals to live together in a, a single detached uh, dwelling. Minister, will you exempt labor-intensive agriculture in the Ontario Building Code, or are we left with municipalities having to work up exemptions to allow more than four unrelated farm workers Question. under one roof? <clears throat> Minister Municipal Affairs. Well, Speaker, thank you to the member for the question. It's not one, as Mr. Wilson smiles at me, understanding the arcane nature of the discussion and the question. Um, I don't have an answer for you today. I'm happy to look at it. We have just finished what I would say is a robust consultation on the building code. Uh, that code is likely to come into effect in one or two years. I don't believe, and I went through 400 pages of documents, case by case, individual issue by individual issue. I can tell you through that consultation on the building code just completed that that particular issue did not come up. I read 400 different suggestions on changes that we could make to the code, some of which would have mirrored what's going on at the national level. My understanding is there's nothing at the national level that mirrors this as well. So I'm happy to undertake a further discussion with the member and see if there's anything we can do in the near term. Thank you. Thank you. The member from No Stop. Time's up. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce Bob Kelly from Markdale and Colin Christie from Oakville. Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to do an introduction of uh, Sam Smichuk, uh, former, a good friend and former uh, colleague of mine, and also her dad, Mr. Smichuk. Welcome to Queen's Park. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Attorney General. Uh, speaker, uh, order. Uh, speaker, I would like to put on the record uh, that the government, in respect uh, for this House and its rules and procedures, readily attends the request for lay shows to answer uh, the opposition's questions. We were disappointed to see that last night an opposition member who requested a late show did not appear to present their own question, nor did they provide any notice with regard to their absence. That's, uh, that's not a point of order. We have, 
We have a deferred vote on the go uh, government notice of motion number four relating to allocation of time on Bill 3, an act respecting transparency of pay and employment. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. On April 10, 2018, Madame de Rosier moved to notice a motion of uh, number four relating to allocation of time on Bill 3, an act respecting transparency of pay in employment. All those in favour, please rise. One in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame DeRosie. Madame DeRosie. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Baker. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Don. Mr. Don. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubus. Mr. Yakubus. Mr. Miller Perry San Mr. Miller Perry San Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fight. Ms. Fight. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Mr. Monsieur Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mrs. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 49, the nays are 32. The ayes being 49, the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.